Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld, uh, CEO and co-founder of RecN with a October 8th Cloud 2030, which was about programmed inequity. And this conversation will make you a little uncomfortable because we're talking about ways that the system is biased against people. Um, and that's a lot of ground to cover. And we wandered all over the place with examples and things like that. This is the foundation for us figuring out how to talk about the topic. So if you don't understand program inequity or there's things about it that make you mad, listen, listen carefully and you'll hear how we're discussing it. Um, and then I'm inviting you to join the conversation because these are societal problems that we need to improve. Uh, if we don't think about how to fix it, uh, the systems are actually set up to reinforce and make things worse, which is a clear topic from this week's discussion. Thank you. Please join us at the2030.cloud. Jen, did you uh, figure out an icebreaker for us? Or? I have an idea for one. If you think it sucks, we could do another one. <laughs> I'll toss it, it out sucks. there and see if it, see if hey, it, it hey. bounces. <laughs> and good morning. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Well, I, I think this is going to be maybe, I've missed a bunch of these just because it's at a really bad time for me. But um, um, I think this I'm might be you. a different type of icebreaker, right? Because the discussion's different. We're not necessarily talking about technology and that's why I thought it was really important to have the conversation because I think the people that are most impacted by um, what's going on already with AI are people that have no say whatsoever in anything so I think it's important to think about it so um should we get started or wait for people Rob the ice wait, are you talking is... about politics or technology I'm sorry I <laughs> missed that part this is the intersection I think well, and I'm not, yes. yeah, it is the intersection, right? But I, I'm going to try to stay a little, I don't know how much we'll say about politics, but I want to think about, um, uh, well, the challenge is, let's think about people that don't get to have a say, and that used to be me. So I don't know if y'all know my background or not, but I'm from a very small town in Northwest Florida, and um, I grew up pretty poor, and until I went to college, which was after I was married and had kids and after I was divorced, um, I was very poor. I was on every type of public assistance there was. And until my brother said, hey, man, the government will pay you to go to school. You only have to work two jobs. That's why I started college. <laughs> so, um, and so for me, it, there's people that just, you know, are, have no say in what's going on, but they're impacted dramatically by what's going on. And it, I think it's very important for us to go beyond thinking, oh, this stuff is cool and this is, it works like this and we put it together like this and look at this new technology to think about the implications of the, you know, I'm this a systems person, architecture person, but this is the architecture, super cool how it works, but the applications that write on top of it, also super cool how they work, but what will they do to people's lives? So that's what this discussion's about. So um, I, that's what I wanted to start with is um, just to talk about, to think about, everybody think about a time when a computer system has interrupted your, your normally scheduled life, when things didn't go the way they were supposed to go because a system changed. Um, and so I could give you some dramatic answers from being uh, from my before times, but like just recently, uh, and this is a stupid example, but this is the kind of example I want you guys to think about before we delve in deeper to real examples. Um, my, I am horrible with phones. I break them all the time. I have lots of insurance on all of them. Um, and I have had Verizon since I, gosh, probably 30 years forever and ever landline till now. And, um, normally their systems are just very difficult to deal with online to get things to decide if I should, should I get my insurance one? Should I get a new phone? What should I do? So I usually go into a Verizon office to talk to somebody to get around all of that. And right now this, these times I can't do that. So it was such a hard process to get a new phone and decide what to do that I just moved to T-Mobile <laughs> completely <laughs> because I didn't want to screw with that system anymore. And I'm able to do that. So that's a small example. Another example I thought of thinking of, okay, what's happened in the last five years? I had, um, I went home and when I go home, I dress like I'm home. I dress like a Florida girl for real. So I had on I was driving to get my mom and me dinner and was bringing it back. 
and I had a ponytail with my ball cap on, no makeup. I had been to the beach all day. Um, I looked like a Florida person for real, without a doubt. And I had to pull over because my stomach hurt so bad that I couldn't breathe and I couldn't think I couldn't drive. And um, people around me called an ambulance because I couldn't move. I get to the hospital and I get pushed to the side of the ER, which is something I'm not used to happening anymore. They would not give me any pain medicine at all. And it ended up being a ruptured ovarian cyst, which the number one thing you do is give the patient drugs. Um, I'm pretty sure I, 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 I refused any other, once I, it got past it and it felt better, I refused any other um, help because I was going home at five o'clock in the morning. Um, they ripped the IV out of my arm. I had blood dripping down my arm. I had to go back in and get it fixed and yell at somebody. But um, I'm pretty sure it's how I looked. I didn't look like, I looked like somebody that wanted pain drugs. <laughs> and that happens all the time with poor folks, you know. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. Like, do you guys have any, any times you can think of when you had a systems issue that you couldn't get past or um, treatment that you were, you reflect back and think, oh, well, I, that definitely was some bias in the way I was treated. Just kind of wanted to get our juices flowing that way. Does that work, Rob? Well, not so much for me, but um, my wife had the same thing happen. Uh, she um, had a bunch of, she, she we, we went to the hospital of Midtown Atlanta uh, because that was the closest one to our office at Georgia Tech, and um, they didn't want to treat her. Turns out that um, she ended up having to have her gallbladder removed. Um, yeah, because, yeah, so yeah, so it, it, it ended up being serious surgery, and um, um, they wouldn't treat her. Wouldn't treat her. She sat in the ER for like eight hours. It was horrible. When they just thought that she was just some hysterical woman that was, you know, in pain instead of actually dealing with the issue. And it seems like that, uh, that kind of bias, at least on, on the healthcare side, it certainly exists, at, at least in our experience. She was a hysterical woman in pain. I mean, hello, that's what they're there to help her with, you know, jeez. How about uh, for is, but this is how we our algorithms work. This is how we that is how the our systems work in terms of the triaging monitoring systems. All our AI, all our uh, application monitoring systems. That's how they work. You if you if you don't have any ways to filter out the noise, none of the monitoring or systems work in terms of that. Uh, performance monitoring, SRE stuff, anything you talk about. So that's the, the, the problems. If you can't filter out the noise, monitoring systems don't work. If you can't filter out the noise in the ER systems, ER room, nothing will work. Okay. What are you but do? Let, me ch let me challenge you on that, right? So like, okay, fine. Even with, this is even before AI, just talking about monitoring systems, filtering out the noise, that's ones and zeros, and that's hard in and of itself. What happens when you have people that bring their inherent biases with them to the, and they are responsible for doing that filtering? A great example just happened in Montreal. I don't know if y'all read about that, but an indigenous woman went in in extreme, mm -hmm. extreme, extreme pain. Mm -hmm. and they wouldn't help her and they gave her morphine and she told them not to because of a different medical condition. Mm -hmm. She live streamed it. She died. And basically as she was dying, the nurses were saying she, this woman was, you know, in her thirties, had seven kids like my mom. And, um, as she's in pain on the floor, they're like, get up. Do you want your kids to see you like this? This is how all you're good for is having kids. And like all of these things that got caught on. That's on horrible. That's and so, but that's what I'm, that, that's the filtering that it, any help she would have received went through that filter. Well, the, so just for another example, I'm, I, I'm right outside New York City and I do not approve of uh, racial profiling, okay? And racial profiling is a way of filtering, mm -hmm. horrible way of filtering. Um, and some people thought it was a okay cost of doing way of doing business, but some, sometimes you, some people make judgments in terms of what's the cost of doing business, of doing business. So in terms of IT, 
what's the cost of doing business? How much more operating costs are we willing to absorb to be able to, to avoid the social costs? What are we, how much are we willing not to, are we willing not to accept the benefits of AI if it's going to have a social cost? And that's the, that's the trade-offs we, have, we should be discussing. And that's why your icebreaker is such a great icebreaker. <laughs> yeah. I think that's interesting that you just said that that's our trade-off is do we use AI or do we not use AI? Because uh, not, is that, is that the trade-off? It's, it's what not use AI, not use AI in general, but in terms of as, as a whole, not AI, not AI, but I'm just saying in terms of there's for in different use cases, there's different costs involved. And we can talk about all the different specifics, but I've just, but in terms of for, I can't, I can't go into more specifics unless we use, go, use examples. Well, I mean, think about um, drug trials, okay? Um, we talk about AIs and AIs, you benefit or you, you teach an AI with your training set. And drug trials and, and health trials are very biased. There, there's a, there are known biases in the data set that they're using to create the drugs that save people's lives. And, and that's just systemic. There are, and it's because of bad history, right? There, there were bad trials that then made people unwilling to work in good trials. But that kind of systemic taint to the data that's coming in impacts everyone from, from then on. So data is a great place to be. Uh, data is how you train in AI, right? Um, the, the math is ambivalent, but culture is encoded in data. Uh, so, you know, the, there's the eponymous uh, AWS HR system a few years ago right, that um, took all of their, you know, what's a successful, a, you know, Amazon employee, it was Amazon, the, part, the parent company, uh, what makes a successful Amazon employee, and they trained an AI to look at incoming resumes oh, yeah. and filter out, and six months later, and this is all public, right, they, they, they issued press releases on this, six months later, they figured out it had not spit out one female resume. Okay, because that apparently was not a success, success factor at Amazon. And to their credit, the HR people said, we're pulling the plug. We're going to reevaluate all the, all the resumes we received in the last six months. And by the way, we have a cultural problem. Okay, and we need to do something to fix the cultural problem because the AI didn't lie. It just exposed it in an unambiguous manner that we have a cultural problem. Uh, for medicine, um, you know, due to my apparent ethnic background and, and I'm a male, I'm white, I'm middle-aged, um, I don't have many problems I've run into on this score. I don't run into many biases because I'm on that privileged side of the bias. In medicine, my genetic background is a notch. It's a very, very tight genetic notch that I'm pretty sure most of the medicines my doctors are recommending for me to take don't have an adequate sample size. So when my doctor says you need to go on statins uh, or something like that, that, that's an actual example, <laughs> hereditarily high cholesterol, but I have no buildup, I've done the heart scans, right? But every time I get a bad cholesterol, it's like, we need to put you on statins. It's like, I will do that if you can tell me if my ethnic group has been adequately tested. Can't do that. There's, the data doesn't exist for them to, say, to make this blanket statement about putting me on a drug to control a condition that may not actually apply to my genetic background. There's just simply not enough data. Uh, to, 
you know, in terms of a bias in medicine, that happens all the time where they, they prescribe you know, drug studies don't use dozens of subjects. And then we use statistics to generalize to that to the bigger population. And we're talking about small, sometimes not very diverse panels for these drug approvals. Um, and so how do you get minority representation? Not just gender, not just racial, but genetic, I mean, true genetic representation to say that this drug can apply equally across, across many different, different regional genetic backgrounds. Um, and I don't, I don't think we're there yet at all. Um, we're not, we, we're just getting electronic medical records and it's been implemented in a spotty fashion in the U.S. The problem that you're, you're mentioning is, I mean, we've mentioned it in HR, we've mentioned it in um, drug testing. It's, it's endemic across everything, you know, all the different elements of human life. I mean, it's not just these, these one little narrow things like, uh, um, Coincidentally, I was re-listening to Mindset by Carol Dweck. I don't know if you guys have read that, but it's a great book. Um, and she was talking about um, bias and stereotyping in, um, in STEM and uh, quoting a study that, um, that where they, they had uh, women and people of color where they tested uh, like a, a math test, for example, and the folks that were reminded of their uh, 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 membership in a stereotyped group, uh, and the way that they did that was they had a checkbox. So check, you know, gender, check race, and uh, the folks that did not have that scored substantially better on the tests than the folks that had that went through the process of checking that box and being reminded that, oh, oh I'm a, a woman and I'm taking a math test and women are not supposed to be good at math, which is total bunk as we all know up here, but there's still that implicit bias that we have. And the risk for AI is that, um, that we impart our bias into the otherwise you know, non-biased algorithms as, as we develop these systems, as well as the biases in the data. So how do we, how do we, how do we separate that out so that, so that these systems become uh, more fair that, you know, just because I live in a wealthy zip code in a Northern Atlanta suburb, um, you know, folks that live on the South side of Atlanta, potentially have the same potential, but you know, they don't have the same access to good schools. They don't have the same access to um, um, credit to jobs because we've got people looking at resumes or AI looking at resumes that are filtering out on certain zip codes and locations. You know, how do you, how do you, how do you fix that? Is, is it a techno, it's not really a technological problem, is it? It's, it's a, a policy problem. So do we think it's a policy problem? Because I, I like what somebody just put in the chat. You know, remember when the digital world was supposed to be the great equalizer. And um, I, I think that we're going to have to do something to make sure that it is. And that's my question kind of out to y'all is, you know, we are, this is a technology group. <laughs> so um, how, what is there that you guys can think of? Because I'm not some, I understand how AI works enough to be able to architect for it, but I'm not necessarily understanding how all of the different um, algorithms themselves work. So I think some of you guys do that for real. So what are there, you know, from a, a programmatic side of things that you can think of that people need to think about as we're feeding data to it. I liked what someone, what, um, what Paul said earlier about, um, you know, the data is what we feed, but that data is, is, could, is what can, you know, that data is what brings, introduces the, bi the bias. So, although I'd probably say it's the information that introduces the bias, even though we think the data is neutral, but. <laughs> So what do you, data, AI, data is gathered with a data is gathered with a particular goal in mind, and 
if it's if the goal that for which you're gathering the data is not well specified or the goal is not not followed then you know yeah you're going to you're going to gather data that is biased it's not a good representative sample you're not you cannot in a in in any kind of way depend on any project projections from that data as being um you know completely objective this is a case where in ai data is code that data is what's generating the actual algorithms and it's perpetuated um unless you think about this as saying all right if i'm going to gather data for a particular purpose i have to explicitly look at what are the ways in which i have to make some selections and make some filterings right then right there and if i am not gathering this data for the specific purpose that it's now being used i'm almost guaranteed to have some bias in it i've just you know i collected it for one reason i collected a bunch of data for a census or for a tax um for uh voter districting and if i use that data for some other purpose very often because of what i've first selected you know as the basis for that data which for its original purpose might have been just fine you're you are basically introducing some factors that shouldn't be there to begin with so it for the purpose that you're using about the only way that you can take existing data that has been gathered in that fashion and clean it up is by compiling data from a multitude of sources about the same populations looking at variations looking for anomalies and if you're lucky but it's only if you're lucky you can start to identify where there is systemic bias in the data and start to correct for it but just to Paul's point about AWS you're taking past history and projecting it to oh this is how we identify you know a a future well if the if the selection at the outset had a had a you know an active form of bias and filtering yeah the the ai is going to do exactly that it's you know remember when we used to talk about computers as being like um very perverse very smart children they'll do exactly what you tell them to do nothing more nothing less and here's a particular case where you have just told it use this data this and if the data itself is you know being used for something else it this is the result you're going to have um you either go back take the data re you know redo it and do it with a specific purpose in mind or you find combinations of data that offset one another that call out the specific biases and allow you to adjust for it i saw i, I think I, you know the, everybody's excited on this go ahead um <clears throat> Maybe this is my my electrical engineering background speaking out too much, but uh, thinking about like control systems, like where we were talking about uh, filtering out noise. Well, how do we do that in a in a, um, a electronic control system? Is by feeding back the output back into the input, right? So if we if we look at the transformation function in the control system as the AI, we're taking sensory inputs and transforming that sensory input into an output, which is perhaps a prescribed action or a selection of a resume or whatever that happens to be. But there is going to be a pattern of in the output, and that pattern uh, 
will deviate because of the bias from some sort of expected norm, like um, so a percentage of females and people of color in the resumes that have been selected, for example. And if there, so if we were able to somehow feed back that that deviation that bias driven deviation back into the ai as part of the input data set uh then maybe that's one way to correct for that and and that would work if the nature of the data is is very much like the kind of signaling signal data you're describing mm -hmm. and most of the kinds of anomaly detection you do on data for that kind of those things, yeah, sure. I'm going to use, you know, parametric anomaly detection, and I'm going to look for things that go beyond certain bounds. But there are other kinds of anomalies in data that don't necessarily show up in the kind of uh, filtering and feedback that you're describing. So once again, it's the nature of the question you've asked and the purpose for which you've gathered the data that has to be addressed. If you don't know that to begin with, or if you don't do that at the outset of a new data gathering uh, situation, yeah, you're introducing bias. I, I guess my concern in this is today that a lot of the mechanisms are about um, money, right? I mean, it's interesting because Tyler, where you where you were going with feedback loops, my mind went, because I have an engineering background too, and feedback loops are powerful and incredibly dangerous in systems because they drive a resonance effect. Resonance effects are self-amplifying and then often break the systems that are actually embedded in it. And what, what you're describing to me, and I mean, we need to talk about, there's so many issues here. <laughs> one, of, one of the problems here is that we are, we're, we're literally amplifying things for profit, for political power, for to, to grab attention, um, not necessarily for the good of the people who are who are contributing to the system. It sounds um, like Facebook. This is the, to me the social dilemma is a core. Um, I'm assuming how many people have seen the social dilemma on the on the group. I'm just out of curiosity. Could have started with a movie review. You haven't seen it, Gina? Oh my goodness. No, I haven't seen it because the clips I've seen make me want to scream and throw things at the TV like the debate does. What's it so about? I, no. I don't even <laughs> want to see it. There's no need to see it. There shouldn't be on no shouldn't be on Facebook anyway. Well, I'll uh, I'll, I'll throw out an example since uh, Facebook was raised. Now, Facebook started with its original site and now it's evolved it's got a mobile platform it's pervasive it's everywhere but one of the stories that i remember was early on there was a feel-good story about how facebook actually sets aside a really old pc in the corner connected with a dial-up modem and use that to ensure usability of their service on even very low bandwidth low uh, capability endpoint devices and i thought to myself gosh that sounds man they're, they're really thinking about that digital divide and in fact, what it really was, was their hunger for mass ad adoption market-wise. So it was, um, you know, depending on what perspective, I, I, was, I was coming at it because I was a big digital divide uh, advocate in terms of, you know, addressing that gap. Uh, when I read this, it's like, oh, this is phenomenal. They must have very, very ethical, informed people thinking clearly about all of the things that keep one group from participating in the digital economy and those that cannot. Uh, in fact, it was just raw hunger for market share and clicks. So uh, even if you're Facebook and you look from the outside like you're maybe doing the right thing, it may be for a, a, a nefarious purpose. Uh, if, uh, if you think of all out market growth, you know, you must take kind of like the teal model of, you know, competition is bad. You should always strive to be a monopoly. If you've ever heard uh, Peter Thiel give that discussion at Stanford. Um, yeah. Those are the things that I think about when uh, even I read a, gr a great story about something that a company might be doing. There's, there could be an ulterior motive. I think, you know, the, def the default for most people, and I think we all like to do this, is you default to assume positive intent until, some, until a company or a person has shown you through history that that is wrong. And your first, react your first default for Facebook or Peter Thiel especially is 
assume bad intent. That but, is the def- that is the default for Facebook. There's there can there can be no argument about that. So we're biased. We're biased against Facebook. Is that the other way to say it? No, I just actually pay attention to history and their actions. So I don't think that there can be. I don't think that is that that is a a bias. But although, you know, you. I, I basically for most companies people. I give them the benefit of the doubt. They have, they, they've earned the bad reputation. So they have to, they, they have pox on them now. And it's unfortunate. It, it seems like one of the things that all of the themes from healthcare bias to um, big pharma bias to tech bias, it all really boils down to it's human underneath the hood that is introducing bias into the system. You know, I'm, I'm in that category of, you know, mid-age, white male, I'm not privileged. Uh, People would think I'm privileged because I'm white male, Um, but I've had my own interactions um, in negative ways um, with bias against me. Now it's not been racial, it's been for other profiling reasons. A, I was a Marine. And I was pulled over many times by police officers who liked to pull Marines over because they hated the Marine Corps in their neighborhood uh, three times. Both two of the times they admitted to pulling me over because I had a DOD sticker on my windshield. And several times because I drive a motorcycle and I'm a bad person because I drive a motorcycle. So bias exists in all of our systems. I don't mean to bring up police as, I mean, because that's obviously a, a hot point in today's world, but those are some of the personal biases I've experienced in my past many years ago. At the end of the day, though, what I hear through all these stories from data sets and AI um, and systems are human bias that's introduced into the path and the problem, which is what a lot of the current big data, AI bias and Facebook's bias, and all of these things are the human system and the bias introduced from those points and is what I sort of see as a common denominator. Right. Shane will always be young to me. What did you say, Andrea? I said Shane will always be young to me. (laughs) I'm almost 50. (laughs) So there's a commercial aspect to data. Um, I mean, we've touched on bias in data systems, but um, so I'm I'm working with a group on what, what the financial community calls alternative data. So we talk about companies and organizations throwing off data effluent, essentially data sewage, (laughs) looking at it. But, uh, but now telemetry, everybody spews telemetry data is, and the leading edge of using data is in the financial markets. So we have this legacy quarterly reporting system, three months these days, it's a huge amount of time. Okay, so companies have to report every quarter. It's expensive for them to even do that, right? And so hedge funds and investment banks are all looking for essentially an unvarnished view of what's actually happening in markets. And so there is, there is a, a, a growing market, it's called alternative data, for whatever data hedge funds can get their hands on to get telemetry on what's happening to companies in real time. So they don't have to wait. The, the, the earnings report either becomes a confirmation or a denial on the part of the company that what the hedge fund is seeing is actually happening. And so these folks are using massive AI systems, right? They're at the forefront of AI training. Um, I've, I've one, my current company has one customer absorbing 22 terabytes of data per day. That's per day. I didn't misspeak. 22 terabytes of data per day on financial transactions, um, financial markets and instruments, um, satellite telemetry, um, everything from traffic to, you know, geopositioning data from smartphones. Um, and so this is actually a, a factor in, um, in Black Lives Matter uh, protests is that without knowing a smartphone carrier, if a smartphone Wi-Fi or radio is on, you can track that smartphone back home from a protest 
without actually accessing AT&T or Verizon, just using waypoints along the way, phones are eminently trackable. So all of this data um, doesn't yet have standards. Transactional data is kind of standardized, right? If a credit card transaction is a credit card transaction, a photo is a photo, satellite photography, you know what to do with. But more esoteric types of data, there aren't labeling standards yet. We're, we're still working on how do you define a data dictionary that tells you what, the f what you're actually getting in a data set? What are the limits of the data? What are, when was it gathered? What's the data provenance? How was it gathered? What was the methodology? And, and maybe what are the potential use cases? So I'll just, I'll stop there because that yeah. whole thing is just real time happening now, mostly to drive financial investments. So yeah, let, let's bring it back to this. And I want everybody to feel comfortable that we're not necessarily talking about tech tech. We're talking about how do we move? How, I think this topic is extremely important to think about the data. And we have to really talk really interestingly about, I, I love the conversations around data and how it can be biased. So I think that's important. But now the stuff Paul just brought up is really, really important because if the data sewage, I like that term a lot, right? So we've got all sorts of data about data, which is what I'm calling metadata because I think metadata is an outdated term at this point. What's the data about data, which is what people are trying to collect? And how do, so the question will be, okay, we know we gave lots of examples. We know lots of examples. We could read all about the examples of how we are programming inequality. We're taking this old time data we're using those data sets to inform newness, and then we're surprised when those, that newness isn't new. It's the same old stuff from before. So what do we have to do and think about as, you know, policy? You seem like you're in the thick of the, the data sewer. So what do we have to think about with all this other data, combining it with old data? Because that's kind of interesting, too. Is there a way to combine the old data with the data sewage? to look at the stuff that may have been biased and find an answer to get to something new. How do we make this uh, something people think about as we are creating solutions? Let me, let me talk about a solution that's already made. If you haven't read the Programmed Inequality book, I'd totally recommend that as a primer to this. So the state of Indiana had a case where um, their Medicare system, a couple of the the people that you would go to talk to and, and advise you on how to get a, to, how to, to manage your Medicaid case colluded together and stole millions of dollars from the state of Indiana. So they decided they were going to use a com uh, company out of Australia to automate all of it. The, the, what the book opens up with was this lady who called them, said she was going to miss her Medicaid appointment because she had to go into the hospital because she had cancer. They took her off of everything, all of her, all of her benefits taken away, and they only put them back the day after she died. It took that long to figure out like what was wrong. So this is already impacting people, especially the most disadvantaged people that we want to take care of, but we don't want there to be fraud and we don't want people stealing millions of dollars that should go to these people. So what can we do to make sure that in the things that we build for the future, which will be AI, like, so what do we do to build them so that we can extract goodness from the data sewer, <laughs> mix it with the old stuff and find something new to help all of us that's not broken. So have and have not, I'll just use racing as an example, F1 racing, um, been a pioneer in technology use, a pioneer in data use, but what they've had to do in F1 racing to prevent the big racing teams from getting bigger and continually winning is first they, had, first they limited their simulation time so they, they said, okay, you can only have like 20 hours of computer simulation time. Of course, that's a moving target. The simulations got better. The computer systems got better. Now there's, there's a dollar limit on the amount of, of time and on the computer equipment they can rent by the time they can spend. And so it's just, they've, they've treated trying to equalize the team's access and make it a more competitive sport. They've actually had to like put a clamp on it just like they did on engine design. On, on, you can only have in F1 racing, pretty much everybody has exactly the same size engine. Okay. Again, to make it a competitive sport is they had otherwise, and this, this plays out in the big get bigger in the overall enterprise community. So one of the things we're seeing today is that hedge funds 
some of the companies have hundreds of billions, trillions of petrodollars to invest. Um, and so they have unlimited, effectively unlimited resources, not just to acquire data, but you have to have the storage systems, the ingress, you have to be able to ingest the data. You have to be able to store the data. You have to have the systems available to process the data. So first step in the process is how expensive is it to acquire the data? It's still expensive. And so you and I don't have access to the data that the financial community has because they are, they're rewarding themselves by making better investments. Okay. Right. Call it alpha is, is that improvement they get from placing a slight, making a slightly better trade based on the knowledge they're getting from this alternative data. And so how do you, part of this is how do you create, now that we have all of this data mm -hmm. and we're trying to create markets for the data, how do you how do you make some of the data available for the public good? Yeah. Well, right. that's, if you go back, Paul, to your example of F1 for a minute. So F1 actually took it further and took some of that AI processing out of the teams and moved it to F1. And so the reason why they did it was that it, there was a, a bit of a, I'm not sure bias is the right word here, but there was a bit of an unevenness where the more um, financially rich teams were having the ability to consume resources and have access to resources that others didn't. And so what they wanted to do is kind of level the playing field. But at the same time, instead of just taking advantage of relatively unlimited resources at the F1 level above the teams, what they had to do was say, okay, we can't strive to perfection. Because if we strive to perfection, then it creates such an even playing field that there's no competition and it's not interesting. So they actually inserted a bit of um, variability into the mix and really didn't fine tune things because like you said, there are a lot of similarities between the teams and what they can do, engines and whatnot. Uh, when I spoke to them last, the one area that they were really kind of focused on was trying to understand the downdraft of air coming off the car in front as it hits the next car right behind it to be able to get the cars close enough, but not so close that it's dangerous, but not so far apart that it's not really that interesting. And at the same time, allow enough variability so the drivers have and the teams each have their ability to kind of put some variability into the mix and make it an interesting race. This, I think it's a great example of where you start to talk about kind of that variability amongst different players that compete and some have more access than others. And so how do you kind of create a more level playing field? But at the same time, how do you make it not so level that everyone's the same, right? You don't make it so generic. Well, and this uh, is fine. This is fine for... Um, we're talking about commercial entities, right? The commercial entities compete for the government monies to help people. So like, and, and the government wants to pay the least amount of money to get this kind of work done. So how do we translate all of this, which is great because it sounds like they are trying to figure out how to, you know, try to figure out how to make it fair. So how do we figure out how to make it fair, but in, in places where we're all pooling the money to get something done and it might not be the biggest amount of money. I, so I should put two links into the chat about, or, about organizations and groups that are doing this now and been doing this for the last 10 years. Um, one's uh, something that's UN based, some basically a group that's dealing with digital public goods and basically everything that's, everything the UN's funding now is focused on making sure that all the data that's available is available is that, that all the data they produce is open data that's available to the public. So if they're generating data, it's available for, and be able to reuse as the public. That's one. Number two, the other one was data, data collaboratives. So everyone's sharing data between government and, and private sector and be, from private sector and between private sector. What can you do pre-commercialization collaboration between organizations? So I'm, I'm a big advocate of let's, let's say open source foundations, standards bodies, things like that. That's what people have to do and you have to be able to get beyond, you have to be able to develop consensus 
people what people don't do in politics these days. It's very important. You have to agree on what where you'll compete and where you won't compete. And that sounds like collusion sometimes, but that's what you have to do. Um, and that's, for me, that's critical. And it's, 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 and you have to have trust and it's, and, um, and sometimes it's very hard, especially because if there's, if you don't trust, say Visa or MasterCard with some of your data, that's going to be, it won't happen at all. But that's what has to happen. And there's a lot of possibilities of things that can happen, but there has to be trust. And it's key. And if people are interested in doing these type of things, there's a world of possibilities. Um, and it's the sky's the limit. Um, the more I, and, what were what I because I'm scrolling up and I'm I've been pulling the links out as, as everybody's been talking. So can you say the two links you, again that you were talking about? Uh, the digital public goods, um, and, and data stewards. In data stewards, and if you follow the data stewards, there's a thousand other links to there. Um, it's um, it's to data collaboratives. Um, I, it's basically if you, there's an organization there are, there are a lot I of, met who basically ran the Markle Foundation 20 years ago, runs this group in, at NYU now. Markle Foundation, for people who didn't know, was basically was funding almost a lot of technology uh, public policy projects for years. Um, I agree with a lot of the things you said. I think it does take collaboration and, and that's why I'm so appreciative. You know, most everybody I work with is very outwardly trying to figure out we we've, we live in a society that we've all been, we all have been trained by this society to think, ha, to have all these biases because that's literally what a society does. That's what communities do. They, they reinforce biases. So this is how we've all grown up. Our parents grew up worse and we're a little bit better and hopefully our kids will get better. So I appreciate everybody trying to get better, but I think that um, I'll just throw this out there. I mean, like the way I, th I I'm not sure that. No, I'm not gonna throw it out here. Uh, it's gonna take Gina, a Gina, Gina, what does that <laughs> what does that mean? Get better. And the reason I ask that is not to not to poke it from a sensitive standpoint, but to say, okay, so if we follow data modeling, and I think you know pretty much anyone that's using a model today, it's based off of past history to a large degree. And so, you know, you think about parents, parents teach their kids. And so there's, it's kind of the same type of downstream effect that takes place. So what do we need to do differently to avoid that bias from potentially propagating? Because if you think about it, two parents, let's say they have two kids. Okay, so now it's a one-to-one -one relationship. If you have two parents that have four kids, now it's a two to four relationship that propagates out. And of course, if you have two parents that have no kids, then that's one thing. But my point is, how do you avoid that bias from being projected? I don't know, right? So from a sociological perspective, it's not just our parents. It's school. Well, it's anything you read in the newspaper, anything you watch on TV, all of these things. And, and I have seen in my lifetime that change. Um, and I know from talking with my mom, since my mom has been here for six months now, I've seen her you know, views change from when she was smaller. And, 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 I, and I appreciate that, I, I do. Um, I mean, I was on Tickville Day the other day and someone said, started to say, okay guys. And he said, and girls, because <laughs> he saw me. And everybody got mad. Oh, we shouldn't be saying just guys anymore. I'm like, but we all grew up with this, right? I think some of it comes down to, you know, is this a school issue, right? Because before it was important to get a liberal arts degree. Now it's important to get a STEM background. But what about, there's things about learning the arts and reading and literature that introduce you to different types of ideas that poke at your own bias and how you were, how you were brought up. So is that part of it? Is, is having that type of education or is having, when you go through learning AI, should there also be a course on the side that says, by the way, think about these things that have nothing to do with technology? Because- no. this, and this I mean, there are, there are a number of places where ethics, mm -hmm. uh, ethical behaviors, you know, standards of be, standards of, you know, 
standards of behavior are introduced into these curricula. But you mean like healthcare? <laughs> you mean like healthcare? I mean, you know, like when you learn. I mean, I know yes. that when I was, when like I was in college. And let me let me let me just let me let me finish one point here. If you are going to do it, you're not going to do it in one broad swath and clean everything out at once. You're going to introduce, you're going to, if you can identify a particular kind of bias, you can, and it's well enough defined, you can, um, you can accommodate history. You can make, you can make a allowances for historical data and adjust things. This is um, kind of what Tyler was speaking about a little bit uh, earlier. Think about what kind of data is gathered for the purpose of creditworthiness and the kind of data that is used to determine fraud when using a credit card. Very similar kinds of data, right? Whether you decide whether a bank decides to give you a credit card or a phone company decides to accept you as a as a customer. They're trying to ascertain your credit worthiness. They've got a bunch of aspects that they're gathering about the individual to make that decision. It is a commercial decision. Once they give you that card or give you that phone, one of the things they're going to continue to do is determine whether it's fraud, whether it's fraudulent, whether it's, whether it's a behavior that is not in accordance with the rules. If one went to ASEAN nations today and went and asked the telephone companies, what do you use to determine whether to give somebody a cell phone account? They would, for the most part, say, oh, well, they have to have a bank account. And more than 25% of the population is unbanked. So what do they do? This is where Paul's alternative data and other sources of data come into play. If they can find a way of addressing who is credit worthy rather than just as a, in bulk, take your bias argument and say, if you don't have a bank account, I can't give you a cell phone account. You find other means to, to ascertain credit worthiness and you reduce the amount of bias that's being introduced. You use so, uh, much of that same kind of data later on to go through and look at fraudulent behavior and try to detect it. It is an ongoing process and it's a matter of determining what's the purpose for which you're gathering the data and being clear about when you use data that's been gathered for some completely other purpose for one in a context that it wasn't originally designed for. So I wanted to uh, look at Habitat for Humanity. So think about how they determine who the homeowners are going to be that they're going to hand the houses to. So it's basically a credit decision, right? And they're they're ignoring all the standard um, data sets for determining that. Uh, 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 zip code, uh, forget that. They're going into all the worst zip codes, right? Um, bank accounts, no. Credit, usually bad. But what they do is they, it, it's, it's, a, it's a prescriptive process where it's if you meet these criteria, if the borrower takes these specific steps, then they'll be able to uh, receive the house, right? So it's, it's instead of looking at the data as a static historical record, they're actually looking at forward indicators of credit worthiness rather than trailing indicators of, of credit worthiness. 
So is there a way that we can extend that approach as a way to reduce biases in other decisions? Well, so, that's when, wait, you, wait, that's when you start talking about <laughs> making <laughs> something <laughs> not <Hold on>. predictive, <laughs> but prescriptive. Is that what you're saying, Tom? I, well, well, I, well, I, yeah, wait, I wait, so. please. I, I, got, I, I have to interrupt y'all because we only have five minutes left and there is, no, there, there is no end bottom of the rabbit hole on this and there shouldn't be a bottom of the rabbit hole. And what, what I want to do, because right, I've been biting my tongue because I have all, all sorts of feels and thoughts too. And I've been listening to what we're talking about and you know, I, I want, and I know a lot of people on the call want us to start moving into the future and, and problem solving and, and, and things like that which we should do, but I, I, we can't do without also having this conversation. So we need to um, work through some structured way to start in these points, right? These are all tangled up points and they're like, we've, we've captured at least five or you know, five, maybe 10 different major topic areas. Um, we can't shortcut this part of the, this, this part of the conversation has to happen we have to acknowledge it, we have to share that we acknowledge it. And then we have to figure out how to narrow the topics enough so that we can go in. We have the same, this is a classic 2030 problem. We have the same challenge on cloud economics or data or things like that, where there's such big topics, we have to figure out how to chisel off chunks of it and then have a very narrow conversation. Um, what I would ask, because we are, we are out of time and I, I do wanna be respectful for that. What I ask is, um, in the chat, one-on-one um, -on -one in Twitter on Cloud 2030, break this down into a topic that you think is sort of foundational and even better um, where the dotted line, right, right now we get to 2020, soon 2021, there's a dotted line that leads into a problem statement. And I would love to hear people talk about things, how, how this problem we're talking about bias gets worse and how this thing that we're talking about gets better. Um, just to sort of seed the, seed the conversation so that we can, we can drive a, a wedge. Um, and then we're gonna have to have you, a little bit more. Do you structure. have an example that, you know, just may not be the best one, but just an example. Uh, no, I totally, I, so I think that if I look, one of the topics we talked about was what I would consider the haystack problem, right? Everybody can contribute to the digital you know, the digital, digital content that we have, but it's gate kept through companies that make profit on feeding you um, information that's gonna keep you on their site or encourage you to buy things. And, and so it's so easy to have a huge amount of great information and then have the filtering algorithm make, make bias decisions on your behalf, profit bias decisions on your behalf. Um, and, and so I think that we need to think about how that could keep getting worse and amplifying the, you know, the, the fact that Google shows you different things, the same people in different houses, different regions, different stuff. And then you could think through what would it look like if people paid for that service or if the data, the search algorithms had to be public or so, right, we, we have these very identifiable things that are causing inequity in our systems and we're good we you know, clearly can identify what they are and the harm and the basis we need to we need to lock those into smaller topics to discuss and then translate forward what what's going to happen if we keep feeding the, the the wolf that you know wants wants to make a whole bunch of money on this data or keep inequity in the systems and what, what do we do if we want to, you know, change the system so that there's, there is more equity for the users, right? And the, and the operators. That's, Rich, you're looking, you're, you're, you're does that help? Um, a little bit. I think yeah. one of the things that you're gonna probably find is that there's the timeline, to your point, how do you deal with data that's already been collected? And when the objective of the data is to categorize 
differentiate and then predict, that's one thing, when, as you've just described, there are areas in which I want to know enough about an individual or a group of individuals that I'm then going to do something to be to modify their behavior. I'm going to mm -hmm. suppress their vote. I'm going to make them buy the the 16 ounce rather than the 12 ounce, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, the point here is what is the objective for which the data has been originally collected and then why is it being used? How is it being used? To do anything that seems to be kind of across the board for all of that, I think is, you know, that's boiling the ocean. I don't think it can be done. It's that's why, well, that's, be a that's lot why more, I wanna, I wanna, more targeted. Yeah, that's why I want to target this down to in small topics so that we can talk about small topics. So um, what if you wanted to just start with one, one topic like the use of profile data to affect behavior, not make a selection about whether you want to give them a loan or offer them a, a something. Do you want to carve it up like that? What do you want to do with it? How do you want to carve that yeah. up? My, my, first, my first goal, Gina, go ahead. No, I mean, that's not the point of this. That's the point of what we see now. The point is, this is, I think to me, the bigger point is this has happened since the beginning of time. Data is data. The way we draw it up and use it and influence other things, that's the information. And if we don't believe that Columbus never set foot in America, if we don't believe that people are inherently discriminated against because they have black or brown skin and that that does not impact everything that's happening in our nation right now, then that's the problem, right? So okay. we have to fundamentally understand that the data is the data Whoever gets, the victor is the one that gets to talk about it, doesn't mean that's what we have to accept 400 years later. How do we get to the point that the data that we're talking about, that we have, whatever means we want to technically deal with it, I don't care. How do we make sure that black and brown people have the same input to our society and are not mistreated based on the data? That's what I want to get to. I don't care how we get there. I don't care what technical way we get there. I want to have the discussion about that. And I want to see that happening. And I understand that feels like boiling the ocean. No, you... that's, that's a, that is a societal norm and it's a societal goal. And I think that's, I think, thought that was really kind of your point to, to bring it up in this conversation. What it, what it came down to was, and the question that you asked earlier was, recognizing that that's been the case. What is it that we have at our disposal right now of a technical means, maybe about the only things that this group can address that would, mit that would mitigate that problem, that would, it can't, may not be able to solve it forever, but it reduces it it changes it, it reduces its impact. I'm all for that. The first, the, the first basis is that people are biased, that there has been bias in the societies. Fine, admit it. That's the starting place. What do you do about it? And that's I think what that I was like your to, question, right? That, and that's where I would like to go with this, right? So we, and that okay. is the problem. There's lots and lots of, and I think getting people to, that was my goal is to get people to think about what's happened to them. Now, can you imagine if your skin's a different color, if you don't have money to go stand up and fight somebody? If, I mean, we've got a vice presidential candidate who is a senator that's being called the monster by the president because she's a black woman. Get out of here. Like, how do we, how do we even have these discussions when people get uncomfortable having that discussion? And this is still, and-, and are, are you so sure we, wait a minute, Gina, are, have, has anybody expressed discomfort? Wait, wait, no, 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 I mean, I, mean, I mean in general, I'm not talking about this group here, I mean oh. in general. So if we have that problem, even having that conversation or even realizing it until someone gets as upset as I get and as outspoken as I get and makes people feel uncomfortable because this happens to me all the time. Yeah, so, but, 
I don't think you're making anybody. Let me, let me, please let me finish. So if, if we have people that are coming out of college and have never had the experience of having someone take them through this or having experienced the, the having experiences for themselves and they're just given something to go program and go do, they're never going to come out of this. They're never going to be able to, to think about things systemically and do things and fix them. So that's where I want to go to. How do we get to this systemically that it's okay to talk about this, that I don't have to seem like I'm angry and, and, and to, to have my voice heard. And how do we get past that so that anybody that is programming or working in AI or with these data sets can accept that, or if they haven't experienced them themselves, but think about going and finding someone to talk to them about this. That's where I want to get to. Let me ask a question. If you could get, if you could get that, if you could get what you're interested in, in the goal that you've just stated, how would you, how would you determine that you'd been successful in the effort? You know, usually when we have a project, we'd like to be able to kind of say, all right, how do I get, how do I, how do I measure it? How do I determine that I've made an impact? How do I, how do I get to the goal? Well, Rich, we've got to define the problem before we can define the success metrics. Yeah. I guess what I was going to say is I would suggest that we focus on a narrow specific use case as a way to constrain the problem space that, that in, in keeping in mind that we could extend whatever solutions that we have, you know, to broader uses to other uses. Uh, but I, I know that's difficult for a group like this because we've got our fingers in so many things, but you know, for example, let's say, uh, let's tackle the problem of, um, lack of diversity in STEM education and uh, women going and pursuing uh, STEM degrees at university, okay? Mm -hmm. we, we can get that narrow and then me maybe even narrower still and start to look at what, you know, what the biases in the data sets and what, you know, what kind of solutions we could come up with. Maybe well, that's not the right specific- In a way, what I was suggesting was a narrowing of yeah. the focus and looking at what was at hand, what was technically available to us at hand to address it. And Gina was saying, no, you have to go back to something um, much more, much earlier in the process, much more systemic. And I grant that you have to do it. What I'm asking Gina is, where is our effort best spent? You tell me and let's talk about it. Let's focus on what it is people in this group could actually make happen. I, Gina, and Lawrence. <laughs> just, I don't think that we're talking about what we're experts on right now in terms of this start off as a cloud 2030 and then we talked where what we're all interested in is data instead of cloud. And so we have a bunch of d data interests, but we're even more interested in these social issues, but that we're not all AI and ethics experts. And there's a lot of people who have a lot more experience talking and dealing with these issues. We're not gonna make a huge difference on a lot of these issues and a lot of people are already working on them. So if we're gonna to try to focus on a couple of topics, Let's try to think about the issues that we, where there's a confluence of expertise and work that, of interest. And I don't necessarily know where that is, but, it, but just for example, Paul's not here, but he was talking about the effluent data coming from cloud, from cloud. That might be an opportunity where um, uh, basically where, where's the biases coming from in terms of uh, uh, are is there a racial bias in terms of um, pricing based off of X Y Z uh, from AWS? I don't know what it is exactly, but there's ways we could think about it in terms of a real that we we get real difference in things that we know about. 
So I, I think don't know what, what it is, but that's I think that we have to focus something on that because so is what you're saying bring experts in that are already working in those domains. Uh, sort of look at their stuff that they're doing. Uh, and just for I mean the example is I there's a uh, totally forgot the guy's name Paul uh, who's leading edge for him who cares about the environment. I this environment's not really an equity issue. But it's a social issue, for example. Um, and he deal, deals a lot with serverless. Just for, I'm just thinking about this. It's like there's intersections of different topics. And that, that could be where there could be something. Uh, I like that idea. Um, I mean, I you know I've, we, I've, this is not relevant here, but in terms of gender and racial stuff, I've, I've done a lot of research and read a lot of other people's research in terms of open source and, and gender and race and, and such. Um, I'm trying not to, I'm a, I'm a cynic on some of these things, so I'm keeping quiet. But, <laughs> but there's certain things um, that we could do. Um, and I think that, I mean, what, a month or six weeks ago, I think what, what Rob and I think the, fa the founders of this group had, we were trying, they were trying to create a bunch of founding principles. Mm -hmm. Still planning I think that. Going back to that and, and, and going back and agreeing on what a few of the founding principles are and advocating those few of those founding principles and what we should be pushing for on those is still a great idea. And gaining consensus around those few founding principles and and um and and maybe the talk should be about piercing holes in those founding principles and um or gaining consensus about them or um finding flaws in them or something like that that's interesting and, and we're way over advice. y'all and i don't want to leave but i really need to leave <laughs> that's, yeah we we should we should wrap up because we're going we're going over and that's sorry not keeping to the uh, contract <laughs> yeah. for the groups everybody we are going to keep coming back to this um if you want to reach out one-on-one -on -one and think about how to organize it i'm happy to talk talk about how to have this conversation in a productive way so thank you thanks bye